Go live now. Yes. Good morning and welcome to the O'Malley Brown Google Hangout where for the next 30 minutes uh, we are going to uh, address the public safety proposal, the comprehensive uh, proposal that Governor O'Malley and I have uh, introduced in the Maryland General Assembly. Uh, Stacy Mayer uh, will be sort of moderating the discussion. I'm joined with uh, Dr. Lowry, our uh, state superintendent of schools, and also Dr. Sharfstein, who's with the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, and Colonel Marcus Brown, who's the superintendent of uh, state police. Uh, this, uh, welcome everyone. Uh, this this morning, we're, uh, this is our effort to reach out to even more Marylanders. Over the course of the last uh, two weeks, we've had town hall meetings in Baltimore City, Prince George's County, and Montgomery County, where we've had um, a, a robust uh, discussion uh, about the legislative proposal, and we've been able to hear from Marylanders uh, about their, to answer questions, uh, to hear about some of their concerns, uh, their, their hopes of what we would accomplish uh, in making Maryland a safer uh, state. So let me just start by saying that the governor and I have introduced this comprehensive legislative package. It has three parts. Uh, one deals with gun control, and as you'll hear in greater detail, uh, there's a licensing provision. So you're going to require uh, Marylanders to license before purchasing uh, guns. Uh, we're also, but it doesn't include uh, shotguns and hunting rifles, and you'll hear more about that. Uh, and that will be in addition to the background check. Uh, we're, we're seeking to ban assault weapons and to limit the capacity of magazines to 10 rounds. Uh, you also hear from Dr. Sharstein about that portion of our proposal uh, that addresses uh, or focuses on mental health and what we're doing to strengthen the mental health system, uh, to be able to share information uh, um, among those who need information to make sure that people who are at risk um, are not uh, in possession of firearms. And you also hear from Dr. Lowry about that part of our proposal where we're going to um, establish uh, school safety protocols through a center of excellence where we're putting $25 million into our budget uh, for physical security measures uh, in our schools, uh, such as automatic locking doors and video surveillance and things like that. So it's a comprehensive proposal. No single uh, component or element uh, of our proposal will rid our communities of violence, but we believe that taking together uh, and in addition to the ongoing uh, steps that we're taking to make Maryland safer, that we will in fact improve uh, the overall safety in, in Maryland communities as we continue to reduce crime throughout the state of Maryland. Stacy. Thank you, Governor. I think uh, Dr. Lowry uh, was next going to tell us a little bit about the school safety proposals. Governor, um, I want to reiterate what the Lieutenant Governor just uh, shared. Uh, we are really pleased in K-12, pre-K-12, uh, that the O'Malley Brown budget includes the $25 million to look at physical safety enhancements. And um, our local jurisdictions are really pleased because we are allowing them uh, to inform us of best of what they can. And this will include all kinds of um, opportunities for new buzzers or cameras and shadows for class. Um, as the Lieutenant Governor also mentioned, um, there is money in the budget for a safety center. And we are really pleased in K-12 education about this because for the first time in a really robust way, we actually get to sit down with um, law enforcement, mental health officials, and emergency officials to get second set of eyes and ears on the plans that we develop every year to see if there are any gaps there that we didn't think of and to also share best practices from across the state in all of those areas, mental health, law enforcement, emergency management. Uh, we are really pleased with that collaboration. And finally, um, in that vein, we sat down with all of those entities and actually looked at our plans that we currently have because the state already requires a total local jurisdiction to have an emergency management plan plan that includes active shooters, and they are required to also run drills every year with their students and educators to ensure that they are prepared. So as this conversation goes forward, we're going to be working very closely with the Lieutenant Governor and um, all of our partners in the state government to determine if we really need to look at our regulations to make them stronger. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lowry. I think, uh, Dr. Sharnstein, if you could talk, uh, tell us a little bit about the public health issues attendant to this discussion, as well as some of the uh, mental health 
um, proposals that are in this comprehensive package. Sure, um, I'd be glad to. Thank you, Stacy, and thanks to the Lieutenant Governor and the Governor for their leadership, and to my colleagues, Dr. Lowry, Superintendent Brown. So, uh, gun violence is a very important public health issue, measured not just in terms of the uh, hundreds of Marylanders who, who die every year, but also the thousands who are seriously injured and even more whose lives are forever altered with the of brother, sister, um, or a parent or child. And so we think that it is very important that there be a comprehensive response. And one of the pieces to the puzzle has to do with mental illness. Overall, mental illness is not associated with violence, but there are um, a, a certain uh, clinical situations when untreated which do have um, an increased risk of violence. Uh, you don't, um, and, and you, know, you can see that uh, perhaps in some of the mass shootings where individuals very clearly have untreated serious mental illness. Um, the proposal that the administration is putting forward includes additional funding for crisis services to help individuals with mental illness better and in expanded training for law enforcement around issues of mental illness, funding a center of excellence for the early diagnosis of serious mental illness um, around late adolescence and early adulthood, a center that can provide support to clinicians and parents, a task force to improve continuity of care so people can stay in it. And it also has some provisions with respect to guns. Um, it, it really is a targeted expansion of the prohibitions um, around guns and a sharing of data so that the background check at the state level is the same as the background check at the federal level. So the, the uh, targeted expansions of, of prohibitions include individuals who are put in guardianship because they don't have the capacity to make decisions for themselves, so they would be prohibited from owning a firearm while they are in that period. Um, and it also includes individuals who uh, are committed by a judge to a psychiatric institution if there is a finding of um, potential risk of violence. So we are um, in the process right now of getting a lot of feedback. We've had some great meetings. We've had one major hearing in the legislature. And a as this process moves forward, we'll be honing this through these different proposals around mental health um, so that we can have a really solid step forward. Thank you, Dr. Sharfstein. Colonel Brown, uh, could you tell us about some of the firearm safety measures in the proposal? Sure. Thank you, Stacey. Uh, and again, I want to begin by just commending the governor and lieutenant governor for putting forward what law enforcement leadership across the country believes as uh, a comprehensive approach to uh, the firearm uh, struggles that we have in the country and the firearm violence uh, associated with that. Um, the, the firearm safety component of it begins with a uh, assault, I mean, a, a ban on the uh, assault rifles. The, the second component of it begins with limiting the magazine capacity um, from a 20 rounds uh, down to 10 rounds. The, the third component is um, an individual that's currently prohibited from possession of uh, firearms in Maryland will also now be prohibited from possessing uh, the ammunition, which again was not um, um, currently um, in regulation here in Maryland. The next part is the licensing component, and the licensing component now is going to consist of uh, a fingerprinting component and a firearm safety training. Uh, along with uh, a background for every purchase um, of a regulated firearm in Maryland. So I think those are the large components on the uh, firearm safety part, but I think an important part to, uh, to make clear is that the, the legislation moving forward is not going to be retroactive, which means if you currently own uh, these firearms uh, now, um, they will, or um, are, are transporting or using the firearms now, um, the, the, the legislation is not going to go into effect until after October 1st. Um, so once that occurs, uh, that's when the legislation goes into effect for everyone. Thank you, Colonel. And Governor, we do have some questions that have been previously submitted, which I could read if you'd like uh, to direct them, or um, I also can follow up with some of them if you think uh, we need some clarity on the proposal. The first question is from Lenora in Gwyn Oak, and she asks, how does the proposal affect law-abiding citizens who already have firearms? Why don't I start with that? Uh, 
first of all, thank you for the uh, question, Lenora. And our goal is not to uh, prevent law-abiding citizens uh, from lawfully uh, own, owning, uh, possessing uh, firearms. Uh, what our goal is, is to prevent uh, criminals, essentially, uh, from possessing and unlawfully using firearms. Uh, we know from studies, for example, in the state of Missouri, that when you have a robust licensing uh, requirement where law-abiding citizens can go in and fill out the paperwork, have the fingerprinting, have the background check, law-abiding citizens can buy the firearms. We know that in those states that have that licensing, it reduces the number of firearms that are in possession of criminals. Uh, and studies have so, shown this to be true. Uh, so as Colonel Brown also mentioned, for law-abiding citizens that are using shotguns and rifles for hunting, which is certainly a tradition not only in Maryland but in this country, um, the proposal doesn't affect uh, the ownership and use uh, of those uh, firearms. Um, and uh, so what we're trying to do here is to enable law-abiding citizens uh, to purchase and to own firearms while at the same time uh, reducing and, and, and ultimately preventing uh, criminals uh, from unlawfully uh, possessing firearms. Thank you, Governor. Uh, and I should say, um, as, as the uh, legislative office here, here in the governor's office and a former prosecutor, that all of the proposals that are mentioned here are prospective. They are not retroactive. Uh, we've had some questions. That's not one of the ones that were posted. But just to assure everyone uh, that this does not affect individuals who, who currently uh, legally possess firearms. The second question that we have is from Janice in Edgewater. What evidence or studies exist that demonstrate that the new laws would work to prevent gun violence? Why don't we have, uh, maybe Josh can handle this, because uh, Secretary Sharfstein, I think, uh, was able to introduce at the last town hall meeting uh, the study or speak to the study from Missouri. Sure, um, I'd be happy to. This is an example of the kind of research that this is based on. And what we've seen is that experts who have devoted their careers to studying what works to reduce gun violence have supported this proposal. But in this particular study, they looked in Missouri where there was a licensing law that got um, eliminated. And what um, they found was that while they had the licensing, the share of crime guns recovered in Missouri that came from Missouri sellers was about 56%. But by 2011, that had increased to about 71%, indicating that repeal of the law made it easier for criminals to purchase guns locally. The share of guns diverted to criminals shortly after a retail sale doubled following the law's repeal. And Dr. Daniel Webster from Johns Hopkins, who did this study, I've heard him talk about it. And um, what he says is that this licensing really, uh, this indicated to him that the licensing really was able to reduce straw purchasers, uh, reduce the, the, the scenario where people get someone to buy a gun for them, and they have to go through the licensing. They don't want to do that. Um, uh, they're much less likely to do that. And as a result, criminals in Missouri had to look harder to find guns um, than, when they, uh, than, than when the licensing got repealed. And um, his, his view is certainly that when it's harder to find these guns, when criminals are having a harder time finding guns, it makes it um, uh, basically makes it safer for the community. And uh, that, that's an example of a study that's been uh, published. And, and I think that um, what we've tried to do in the legislation is identify specific um, me mechanisms or provisions that are, in fact, supported by uh, evidence like this. Thank you. The next question we have is from Jen in Havre de Grace, and she asks, in the short term, what are schools doing to improve their security? Dr. Lowry? Thank you. Um, one of the things that I mentioned earlier is the process we're going through with law enforcement uh, and mental health officials at the table with us to actually look at the plans that the school system 
systems to currently have in place around safety and security. So we're reviewing those plans and doing a gap analysis because I will tell you that what we're actually in process of doing is strengthening what we already have. Some of our districts have really robust, um, extensive plans around making sure that students and educators are safe and secure. So we're going through doing gap analyses and finding ways that from district to district we can share best practices. Thank you. The next question is from Hale Thorpe. It comes from Tanya. And she asks, why is the governor proposing an assault weapons ban when they account for only less than a, a 1% of homicides in Maryland and less than 3% of homicides nationwide? Well, let me, let me start and then certainly uh, Colonel Brown can pick up after this. Uh, the reason why we're proposing uh, a ban on assault weapons, because as is mentioned uh, in the question, uh, they do account for a number uh, of uh, homicides uh, in Maryland uh, and around the country. We recognize that banning assault weapons is not the only answer to reducing gun violence uh, in Maryland or around the country. Uh, but we also recognize that by eliminating, uh, by banning assault weapons, we will be able to reduce the number, even if it's a small percentage. Uh, but you can't look at what we're doing solely in terms of banning assault weapons. It's banning assault weapons, that's a small percentage. It's licensing, which will probably account for a larger percentage. It's the work that we're doing to make our schools safer. Uh, it's the work that we're doing to improve the mental health system. It's also the extraordinary work that continues to happen uh, each and every day by local law enforcement, by the Maryland State Police, and our partnership with uh, law enforcement agencies uh, throughout the state and the country. Their efforts to uh, reduce violence, to uh, take off the streets uh, unlawful weapons. So uh, we're not just focusing on assault weapon ban. That's just part and parcel of a larger, more comprehensive approach to reducing gun violence. Thank you, Governor. As a sort of a follow-up, actually, uh, to that question, uh, John in Kingsville asks about the 10-round magazine capacity limitation, but why that's important and what criteria was used uh, to focus on 10 as opposed to the current 20-round limit in Maryland. Why don't we let uh, um, Colonel Brown pick that up? Yeah, I, I, would also, I would also like to just jump back and echo what the Lieutenant Governor said in reference to uh, the violence with um, uh, with these weapons. You know, law enforcement does not believe for a minute that, you know, uh, this law alone is going to end gun violence. You know, law enforcement is still going to continue to focus on what we've always been focused on, and that is ensuring that we're targeting the worst criminals in this state, the most violent criminals, that we're ensuring that our deployment is going after that small number of people that is causing the majority of crime in this state. And we're going to continue to work with our federal partners and prosecutors to ensure that those are the, the, the targets that are going to get the hardest prosecution are going to be put in jail for the longest amount of time. So when law enforcement looks at this legislation, again, we're not looking at a specific one specific part of it. What we wanted is comprehensive legislation that focuses on the big picture of what's going on here with this legislation and this issue. And I think correcting some of the issues that we have in the gap on the mental health portion of it to ensure that if there are mental health issues that those people are not getting guns, I think that was very important for law enforcement. For everybody, I think making our schools as safe as possible, whether that's a school resource officer, whether that's additional security, whether that's training, or whether that the school system is following the best practices laid out there across the country. Those are the things that law enforcement leadership wants to have happen. And then finally, on the gun aspect, again, law enforcement uh, believe that there is, uh, there are people that feel that having a firearm in their home for security reasons, law-abiding citizens, that's supported, and that's supported by the legislation. You know, the, the last issue on, on reducing the, the magazine rounds from 20 down to 10, again, we feel people securing in their homes, securing their homes, having the ability to have a firearm for 10 rounds, that they're going to be able to still do that. But we don't want to see our scenes on the streets where there are 800 you know, 10, 30, 40, 50, hundreds of cases on a street on the street corner, and and uh, the carnage that comes from that—that's uh, what law enforcement struggles with. And there are many scenarios where 
uh, a suspect is reloading their gun and has a struggle as a result of that, and that allows either citizens or law enforcement at law enforcement at that time to intervene. Thank you, Colonel. And Governor, I think that we heard from Scott Schellenberg at the initial hearing, uh, who is the state's attorney in Baltimore County, in terms of what Colonel Brown just said about uh, the time it takes for a suspect to reload gives either a uh, good Samaritan or law enforcement the ability at that time to overcome the suspect before they can actually discharge more rounds. Uh, Scott Schellenberger uh, discussed the Perry Hall shooting in which the shooter there had uh, one shotgun shell in his shotgun and 12 additional rounds in his pocket. Because he was only allowed or uh, capable at that time of discharging one round, a guidance counselor was able to stop him uh, before he could shoot additional persons. He did, however, in his confession indicate that he wished to, uh, prior to going to the school, obtain a, a gun that was in his home that had uh, additional rounds, a, a higher capacity magazine, because he wanted to hurt, injure, or kill as many people as possible. So that time it takes to reload gives law enforcement and ind individuals a chance to overcome uh, a suspect, and we have seen that and multiple times in mass shooting contexts, uh, both in Maryland uh, and elsewhere. Stacey, let, let me also yes, say this. I mean, I've spent 28 years uh, in both active duty uh, and in the United States Army Reserves, and I've had an opportunity to train on and fire uh, M16 rifle, the M4, and a host of other weapons. And I can tell you that, you know, when I went to Iraq, uh, all of us were clamoring for 20 round, 30 round magazines because we knew that on a battlefield uh, the more rounds you can have in that magazine the better off that we believe that we would be. But when you're talking about assault weapons in civilian populations there's absolutely no need for 20 round magazines. Quite frankly 10 round magazines offer a ample opportunity to defend yourself and uh, if well trained and that's part of the, the safety training that, uh, that, that will be um, uh, offered, uh, you'll, be, you'll be prepared uh, to be able to change out magazines safely uh, so that if you're in a situation where you need more than 10 rounds, uh, then uh, you know, you'll be able to adequately be able to do that. Uh, but those 20 round magazines are great for the battlefield. Um, I just don't see a place for them uh, on, the, on the streets uh, or even in the homes uh, in Maryland. Thank you, Governor. Uh, the next question we get comes from Salisbury. Uh, Israel asks, what steps are you planning to take to protect Second Amendment rights of Marylanders? I'll, I'll start with that. Uh, certainly, uh, one of the things that we've done is we've asked the Attorney General's office uh, to look at our proposal uh, and to offer an opinion as to whether or not it uh, meets the uh, requirements, it satisfies the requirements uh, to protect rights under the uh, U.S. Constitution, and the opinion came back uh, that said it does. Um, we recognize that we're asking law-abiding citizens uh, to take a few additional steps uh, in order to purchase a firearm, uh, but by no means are we limiting or preventing law-abiding citizens from exercising their constitutional rights. Um, so uh, we've carefully considered it, and we think that we've struck a, a good balance uh, with the proposal that we've set forth. Thank you. We do have a question perhaps for Dr. Sharfstein, and it's from Travis in Silver Spring. He asks, how will the civil rights of those who seek uh, help for mental or emo emotional issues be protected in this legislation? Uh, sure. Um, are you able to hear me? I am. Okay, great. Um, you know, I, I don't think this legislation impedes the civil rights of individuals with, with mental health conditions. Um, all the civil rights that people have are, are they would still have. I think that what it tries to do um, under the law and the kinds of restrictions on gun ownership that um, have been considered and in fact are implemented in other places, it, it has a, a targeted expansion of those. And one thing that the law does that um, I think is relevant to this question is that it creates a process for people to have their gun rights restored, a process that really doesn't exist in implementation right now. So that um, if people have lost their gun rights, they will be, and, and they want to make the case that they're um, uh, doing better and are able to um, possess firearms, and they will be able to make that case, and there'll be a process that they can go through uh, to do that. So I think that from that perspective, it, you know, um, will, will, uh, 
un, you know, be more um, conducive to uh, individuals. And, and I also think that uh, overall it, it should not um, impede civil rights. Thank you, Dr. Sharfstein. But Courtney in Baltimore asks whether we have any strategies to identify and secure illegal firearms. And perhaps Colonel Brown may want to address that. Yeah, I would. And, you know, I do. Again, I think I wanted to make sure that everybody understands that it's very important that law enforcement is not looking at this legislation as a silver bullet to stop us from doing what we have done for the last, you know, six, seven years to reduce violent crime in Maryland. You know, violent crime in Maryland is down to its lowest levels in 30 years. And we're doing that because we're targeting the worst of the worst, the, the people that we know are violent criminals who are out there using guns to commit crime. And again, we use data-driven policing to do that. We're mapping these uh, criminals out. We're ensuring that parole and probation is, is focused on the worst criminals to make sure that, that they're getting the, the, the highest level of supervision. And when, there's, you know, uh, when they're committing crimes, when they're involved in crimes, that we're making sure that those are our priority targets. And we go beyond that to ensure that prosecution is doing the exact same thing. They've got the list of who we want to make sure is getting uh, put in jail for longest amount of time. And that's what's going to occur in this case. And we're going to continue to use those strategies to continue to reduce crime in Maryland. Thank you, Colonel Brown. And I think it's important also to focus on uh, what Dr. Sharfstein mentioned and uh, the governor mentioned earlier about uh, the importance of the licensing to stop straw purchases, the illegal straw purchases. Uh, we have seen uh, really uh, quite good data uh, and research uh, that shows that having an upfront interface with law enforcement, a licensing component when an individual purchases a handgun, in fact discourages illegal straw purchases. Uh, and so the legislation would in fact strengthen those protections as well. We also have a question from Columbia from Suzanne and, and she questions whether or not uh, the proposals would have any effect or would have prevented what happened in Connecticut. And, and asks, uh, are more gun laws really the answer? Let me, let me take uh, uh, um, uh, uh, the first uh, shot at that. Um, you know, we don't believe that any single component of our comprehensive approach is the answer in and of itself. But let me just, by way of kind of analogy, you know, four years ago, my cousin Kathy uh, was murdered by her estranged boyfriend and it drew my attention to the issue of domestic violence. Um, the next legislative session we introduced and successfully passed a law that gave judges greater authority to order domestic abusers to surrender their firearms um, in when a protective order is issued. We've done a lot of other things as well. We've, we have more hospital-based domestic violence screening and referral programs. We now have unemployment um, compensation that's available to victims of domestic violence. Uh, we now have almost every law enforcement in Maryland using the lethality assessment uh, program to evaluate uh, whether or not someone's at a greater risk of harm by a domestic abuser. Uh, and there are a number of other things we've done. Since that time, over the last four years, we have reduced domestic violence crimes. We have reduced domestic violence homicides in Maryland. And we've reduced the domestic violence homicides that involve firearms. I don't know if it's because of the fact that judges have greater authority to order abusers to surrender their firearms. I don't know if it was because of the domestic violence screening and referral programs in our hospitals. I don't know whether it's any one of the other things that we've done, but what I do know is that taking together those measures have resulted in a safer Maryland. That's what we believe will happen with this comprehensive package that we have introduced to the General Assembly. Banning assault weapons, licensing for firearms, a more robust mental health system, and school safety protocols. Taking together, we believe firmly based on evidence we have seen in other states, that we will reduce the level of violence and gun-related violence in Maryland. So whether or not it would have stopped or prevented what happened in Newtown, Connecticut, that is not a reason for us not to look at ways to make Maryland a safer place. Very true. Thank you, Governor. I think we have uh, time for one final question, 
and it comes from Stephen in Upper Marble, and he asked whether hunters under the age of 21 will be prohibited from hunting under the proposed legislation. Uh, I don't know if uh, Colonel ba Brown would like to take this question, or you, Governor. Uh, if not, I can. I think I might be able to answer this one. Well, why don't you take that one, Stacey? Okay. <laughs> Seems sort of unfair to take the last one as the moderator, but okay, thank you, sir. I just want to assure everyone uh, that there was nothing in this legislation that was intended to affect uh, the hunters uh, in Maryland and their ability, and uh, hunters under the age of 21, uh, to hunt in Maryland. Uh, we have received a couple of inquiries uh, based on what Colonel Brown mentioned as the ammunition restriction. That is, if you're prohibited from uh, possessing a firearm in Maryland, a regulated firearm, regulated firearms are not hunting rifles and shotguns, that you are then prohibited from having ammunition. Uh, we do not think that hunters under the age of 21 are included in that prohibition uh, because it's only mentioned for regulated firearms which are not hunting rifles and shotguns. However, let me assure everyone that to the extent that there is any confusion in the legislation, we will work to make it clear that hunters under the age of 21 are not affected by this proposal. I think that should answer the question. I don't know if Colonel Brown has any other uh, thoughts he wants to add on that. Well, I think you hit it uh, right on the point. I think the idea was that you know, the legislation's not finalized now, so we're reaching out to, you know, in our gun forums going across the country, obviously down in Annapolis, we want to hear from everybody to make sure that we're tailoring this legislation to make sure that legal gun owners and continue to own guns and sportsmen in Maryland uh, um, have their ability to continue doing what they love. Thank you so much. <laughs> Governor, I think that's all the questions we have time for. I don't know if you'd like to say anything to end this Google Hangout, but thank you for having me. Let me just thank uh, the members of the panel, uh, Dr. Sharfstein, Colonel Marcus, Dr. Brown, and I also want to thank you, Stacey, for moderating. But more importantly, I want to thank all of our viewers for giving us an opportunity to clarify our proposal, to explain sort of our intent and purpose. Uh, and we hope that over the course of the last uh, three uh, town hall meetings, and this Google Hangout that we've been able to answer most, if not all of your questions. So thank you very much.